or your eyes water, one of the two. <laughs> yeah. So how is everybody this morning? A bit fresh, a bit early. <laughs> Feels too much like a church service now. <laughs> yeah. I've been pushed back so that there's light on me as well. That's the whole Igor's worry about the amount of light that we had yesterday. So we've move, moved the everything forward and put me right up against the wall, ready to be shot, I suppose. But <laughs> Uh, all right. Is it time to get started, you feel? How did you enjoy yesterday? Yeah. It was good. Um, I felt uh, before we started yesterday quite uh, flat. Most people were feeling quite flat. And uh, then as we talked about love more and could see the differences between the world's view of love and God's view of love, just there's a sort of a, a change from flat to enthusiasm then, isn't there? Like, there's a change that occurs inside of us when we start reflecting about love. So um, I feel that was really good, that you could feel those changes happening as well. Now today's subject... Uh, sorry, David. Um, oh, sorry, we haven't, haven't organised our mics yet, have we? Yep. Oh, yes, okay. So if you could... Dave's got his hand there, if you could just... Who's got the mic on this side? Awesome, thank you. AJ, um, given that um, you mentioned yesterday about fear um, being a large part of, or, or dealing with our fear, yep. uh, getting to, to uh, God's love and truth, do you want to say anything about fear this morning in general? No. Like <laughs> Is that all right? I feel I've talked enough about fear and um, I feel many of you need to go back to those presentations that were done, have a listen to them if, if you can. We, we'll have them produced on DVD very shortly, they are, many of them are already on YouTube as a download and my suggestion is go back to the fear talks that I did, the fear revisited talk, fear is your friend talk as well um, and just allow yourself to feel about it because you'll find with a lot of this material that when you go back sort of 12 months later or 18 months later that your whole viewpoint has changed quite substantially and because your viewpoint has changed quite substantially you have a different outlook on what the material on the material that's getting presented so I feel we've had enough discussion about fear in fact in fact, what I'm feeling at the moment is we've almost had enough discussion about emotion as well, to be frank. There are, there are many other subjects that I'd like to present. Obviously, we had to present the information about emotions and fear and all of those kind of things. We had to present that so that... Uh, and can I just... Nora, can I just... Uh, hello, Nora. <laughs> and David and other ones who are doing photographs. Could you please not come up the front because you just distract the audience when you do. They're all looking at you and then get distracted. Yeah. And so, so what happens is that... Uh, um, what was I talking about? Emotions, that's right. Um, what happens is I feel we've, we've had a long discussion about emotions over, over quite a few years now. Many presentations have been done about emotions and emotional processing. There's many presentations that have been done about the general structure of emotions, the different layers of emotions, um, how to deal with different emotions and all of those kind of things. And I feel uh, there's not much point in continuing with the same kind of material over and over again when there's so much other material that can be presented. Please remember that the divine love path isn't about emotions. It's actually about connecting to God and living a life of love. And to do that, you've got to be emotional. And so we've got to talk about emotion. But, it, but the divine love path isn't about emotions. It's about God, love, truth, those three things in particular. And, and this is where I feel a lot of times uh, we have a tendency to get a bit misled when we start talking about emotions as if that's paramount. And then a lot of people around us start thinking, oh, all you're doing is emotional processing and all those kind of things. Many times, by the way, we're emotionally processing spirits' emotions 
rather than our own because of the different layers of resistance we have in us. And what I feel is that all of that has been discussed. We've talked about the spirit influence, the spirit obsession and possession. We've talked about the, the overcloaking of spirits over you when you're in an emotional process. We've talked about all sorts of things like that over the last two or three years. And all of this material is available to you. So we really don't need to rehash it. My, my feeling is that my responsibility isn't to assist you with your emotions. That is your responsibility. Uh, my responsibility is to feel my own emotions <laughs> and not assist you with your emotions. Your responsibility is to assist yourself with your emotions and have a desire to do that. Your responsibility is to open your own heart to the process if you desire to do so. That's your responsibility. That's not mine. My desire, not responsibility, but desire, is to teach you the truth about love and the truth about truth. That's my desire. And so what I'm trying to do is engage that desire more and stop having conversations over and over again with the same people, with the same subjects, on the same material, rather than presenting more truth to you. And remember I once said to you that with regard to truth, the more truth that gets presented and the less that actually enters your heart, there's a discrepancy between the truth that's being presented and what's entering your heart. And after a while it becomes very, very confronting. And I feel sometimes what we're doing when we're reverting back to emotional conversations is that you're trying to stop me from confronting you further when the reality is that all of us need to be confronted further with truth. There is so many beautiful truths to present still, far, far more than many of you at this point realise. And we'll, I would like to have the time to do all of that. So one of the things that we are doing as a result is that we've started a process where myself and Mary are getting interviewed by a single interviewer. We're, we're compiling all of the questions on certain subjects together and then we're having a single interviewer interview us that we're recording and then we're going to upload all of those interviews to YouTube and we're also going to produce DVDs of them. And what that allows us to do is to present question, like a subject matter with all the different questions that we've been asked over years of time all in one presentation. And at the moment a lot of times there's a bit of, a bit of the answer here and a bit of the answer there and a bit of the answer there all over the place. Whereas what we're trying to do now is we want to put a lot of these answers all together into one presentation, just a couple of our interview presentation. And what we're thinking of is we'll probably be doing that more than doing some seminars for a while to get a lot of material and a lot of truth out there in a very concise format where a person can actually just listen to one presentation about God, for example, and have lots and lots and lots of different questions answered in that presentation. And, um, and the interviewer process means that there's this sort of a dynamic as well between ourselves and the interviewer, which, uh, which means the interviewer can ask touchy questions and questions that a lot of people want to ask, but some people are afraid to ask those kind of questions. And so we have the opportunity to address all of that. So that's what we're looking at doing over the next coming months. And we've got already quite a number of people teed up to do some of the interviews on different subjects. And we're hoping to do them one or two interviews of those types a week. So over a period of a month, there'll be like finish up being six to eight like subjects that we present in a fairly concise manner that um, can be then placed on YouTube or placed on DVD so that people can um, access a certain subject and get a lot of answers about those particular questions. So we feel at the moment that uh, the information about emotions and, and, uh, and a lot of things related to emotions we really feel that we've covered all of the essentials that we need to have covered. There's a few extras that we will be doing in some some time, which is the law of cause and effect and how that affects you emotionally and a few other things like that. But there won't be um, we won't be spending too much more time on the issue of emotions and emotional processing. And for that reason, uh, we're going to spend less time on addressing emotional issues in people and more time and just pointing out when something is loving or unloving 
and then leaving you with the responsibility to determine why the unloving behaviour occurred. Sometimes at the moment you're trying to make me responsible to tell you about why your unloving behaviour occurred. And we need to stop that, I feel, and, and become more personal responsible, more personally responsible for the behaviour that we exhibit. Because in the end, that's how it is with God. Right? God makes us personally responsible for every action and every feeling that we have, which is something that obviously we all need to do. So does that make sense, David? Like, so that's why I don't want to discuss fear much more. I will be discussing certain things in terms of the relationship between emotions and why we view God a certain way, the relationship between emotions and why we view love a certain way and so forth. But I'm spending less and less time on this actual process of emotionally clearing or allowing emotions to flow. Okay. Yeah. One more question. Yep. A couple of months ago, I think it was Greece, you, you said that um, you were gathering information with regards to earth changes and we're going to do a presentation or something. Where um, are you with that? Yes, um, we're... Little, a little further advanced on that, um, we have a team of mediums that are working on that particular information. However, the problem that we're having to address is that um, the mediums themselves has, have their own emotional fears and concerns. And as a result of that, it's heavily influencing the material. So the first thing I need to do is work with that group of mediums and help them work through the emotions that are preventing them from channeling accurately information about earth change events. So that takes time and I can't guarantee how long that's going to take. We're just working every week with a, with a team doing that. But uh, how long it takes for that team to become open to channeling that material is completely dependent upon their personal desires and passions to work through their emotions about why they're blocked to that material. Does that make sense? So, so again, um, a lot of the things that are happening are happening in the best possible way to address the emotions of the individuals involved and address you know, the blockages that they have towards channeling the information. We can't guarantee when that information will become available and it's very important to me that it's quite accurate or as accurate as I feel it can be at the moment. And, and for that reason, we're just allowing the process to continue and allowing the different people involved to you know, decide whether they want to deal with their emotions about that material or not. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you don't channel any of that stuff yourself? Um, well, yes, I can make a lot of statements about what I feel uh, from my own soul about what's going to happen. And once I'm at one with God, obviously that information will be the most accurate information that you can get on the subject. But that's not the point of the exercise. The point of the exercise is to help a group of mediums to get to a point of being able to channel any information at all. Um, that's the point of the exercise. To, to be honest with you, David, I am not very concerned about earth changes. Yep. Um, in fact, in, for my own self, um, it's a very low issue on my own personal priority list. <laughs> um, I feel that many are concerned about earth changes because of the fear that they have and, uh, and they're not allowing themselves to feel properly about the subject. But I also feel that for many the subject is far too important uh, in their own feelings uh, because of their fear than other very important subjects including <laughs> and the highest being our desire for at one moment with God and our desire to love <laughs> our desire to be in truth, our desire to live a, a life full of passion, these four issues are far more important than the issue of earth changes. And yet I keep on getting asked question after question. And one of the reasons why I have responded in different talks, particularly in Greece, was because I had a series of questions after questions asked about earth changes around the world. Um, and that's the reason, only reason why I've really addressed the issue. From myself and Mary's perspective, from my perspective, and my perspective is still a little different than Mary's, but my, from my perspective, I feel earth change issue is interesting from a scientific perspective <laughs> and uh, interesting from a point of choices that people make. And it's interesting how many people make choices that are in direct disharmony with what their soul knows to be true. So I find that quite interesting as well. But from my personal perspective, Earth changes are almost like 
Um, while they will be an event, they're not a major event like somebody becoming at one with God or like somebody making a change from the second to the third sphere in their life or something like that. To me, that's a more important event um, than, than any other physical event that will occur. And I feel to a large extent that some of the adverse media attention has occurred because of the concern in different people about the... Um, yeah, the concern in different people about the events, if you like, that might come have actually caused an attraction where people are focused on that particular material when, it, when if you look at the full volume of material that I have presented, that particular, those particular questions firstly have been at the response of questions people have asked and secondly have, have been very small in, amount of, in comparison to the total material that's been presented. Yeah, so um, you'll need to be patient if you're waiting for earth change material and the question I would ask all of you if you're waiting for that kind of material is why are you waiting? Like you have the capacity to work out what's going to happen in your particular region, you have the capacity to receive spirit information if you desired it, you have the capacity to, to have a feeling and act upon those feelings about where you live and so forth, so feel it allow yourself to work your way through that and look at your resistance look at your comfort you know how addicted to comfort we are is a huge issue and uh, allow yourself to see all of those kind of things yep. is that okay so. yep. is there any other questions unrelated to the topic that we're going to ask Dion thanks down down here if you keep your hand up that's a thanks AJ um, the question is on the same topic, mm -hmm. um, more about, I guess, the, the fears and concerns of, with earth changes is if you live on the coast, <coughs> mm -hmm. is as to when it's going to happen. And, of course, you know, you mentioned about the more priorities with being at one with God and loving, living your truth and, yeah. and, and passion. Can I address this when issue? Well, I guess the thing is, it's just I want to still live. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah of I mean? course. And so, and what I'm hearing is that it's going to be fairly soon, like it's next year, maybe in the first six months, that there can be ma some major events. Well, it's possible, but let's look at the issue of when from an emotional perspective rather than looking at it, what's going to happen and when should I move? You see, you see, the main problem the majority of us are facing when we come to this issue is we are not looking at our desires. We are looking at our fears. So, so where do you, you desire to be? If you desire to live on the coast, then stay on the coast. Don't come over just because you're going to die. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Stay on the coast if that's where you desire to be. If you desire to live a life that's in the coast and you have all of the attractions on the coast, look at the soul-based reasons why you have those attractions. So what, what do you find so good about living in that location than living in a less built-up location like around where we're currently living here. There's obviously some emotions involved and those emotions would need to be addressed. Now, you're not going to address them coming over here without just out of fear. You're better off living there, feeling your fear about possible death or possible sudden you know, event occurring that prevents you from getting out of your situation, but also feel about why you're staying there, what are the other attractions, what's going on with those other attractions and so forth. The, the reality is the coast obviously has a lot more beautiful um, climate. It has a lot more beautiful, um, in, in some ways, like, I, I, you know, these are all debatable issues from a personal perspective, but most people feel it's a bit more beautiful climate, more beautiful surroundings. Everything's at your beck and call. Everything's, you know, available to you at any point in time. You don't have to travel 40 k's to go shopping. You travel 5 k's instead, that kind of thing. All of the, you know, the restaurants and the theatres and the, the, everything else are all available as well. So that sort of adds to this feeling that I'm a part of a cosmopolitan society that's functional and feels good. And so there are a lot of emotions involved with staying uh, or moving. The key is to address them emotionally rather than focusing on when is the event going to happen. And like, so, so if I said, well, the event's going to happen on 23rd of March... Uh, 2012, right? 
that's going to be the first event if I said that. Uh, it's not the truth, by the way. But if I said that, then many of you would then go, oh, on the 22nd of March, I'm going to do something. <laughs> <laughs> right? Or maybe you might leave it a couple of days, just in case. And, and the reality is you would be responding totally out of fear. You wouldn't be responding to your desire. You'd be responding to what I'm telling you. And that is a terrible reason to make a decision. D do you see that? Like, it's a terrible reason to make a decision. Why would you make a decision based on what anybody tells you? That ten there's, a, there's a feeling in that of not really wanting to sort out your own life, take responsibility for your own life and determine what you want to really be doing in the long term. So my question would be more, stop worrying about when and worry about getting your act together to fill your desires. Feel your desires, feel your longings, where do they take you? And go there, wherever they take you, so that you can address whether this desire is pure or impure. Do it for that reason, but also do it for many other reasons. Because when you're in a passionate, desirous place in your life, things happen. A lot of things happen that are totally different to normal. And things, it's a beautiful process when you do that. You know that yourself, you know, like... You've, you've just had a conversation with me earlier about how your life has rapidly changed in the last year, all from connecting with this desire and passion within inside of you. So continue to do that. Don't, don't put that off. When you worry about the when, you are now either holding off certain decisions to a certain time, which is a terrible way to live your life, or you're making decisions based on potential fear-based events which is also a terrible way to live your life. Well, it's it, true because like, I intuitively asked, what shall I do? I'm hearing all these things. And the message I got come through was follow your purpose. Just exactly. follow your purpose. Don't worry about anything else because if you're living your purpose, and there's evidence for that because I've had some incredible surprises happen in the last 12 months. Exactly. That I wasn't expecting. Exactly. But it took me some time to intellectually digest and realise, oh, this is a part of my journey. Yeah. Um, so it is that. But then I'm hearing lots of things and maybe I should be... I understand what you're saying though. Yeah. yeah. So just keep on doing the work. Yes. Yeah. And uh, there's a, there are some other aspects to it that I probably should mention. One is that we cannot expect other people to take responsibility for our life. So, so, for example, if we've decided that we're going to leave getting away from the coast to the very last minute possible, if we even believe earth changes are ever going to occur, we're going to leave it that, that it's going to be the very last minute possible and then we'd move. The, the only problem with that scenario is that you are relying then on other people to provide your basic necessities, such as food, water and shelter. And would that be a loving thing to do? For me to live over in comfort, where I feel everything's comfortable, to the very last minute and then expect to come over somewhere else that's comfortable <laughs> without myself taking responsibility for my life in that process. Well, that, obviously that wouldn't be a very loving thing. And if you think you're going to come to my home doing that, then I, I'm going to be asking you to leave. And the only time you're going to be staying is if you point a gun at me and, and, uh, and, uh, and then I might leave. But, <laughs> but the reality is that uh, for the majority of us, we do have some expectations that the government or other people look after us rather than us taking personal care for our own life. And this is partly some of why, why we leave decisions to the last minute, you know, that we have a, a feeling of... Uh, there's a word for that, isn't there? What is it called? Procrastination. Yeah. And uh, I don't procrastinate, I just put things off, you know. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's how we often feel inside of us. And we feel that way about taking responsibility. We often uh, procrastinate in the issues of taking responsibility for our life. So if you're a person who doesn't care either way, whether they pass or, or not, my suggestion to you is the same as whether a person who is fearful about whether you're going to pass or not, and that is follow your desires and passions and they will eventually all lead you to the place where you want to be. And ironically at that point, 
it will also lead you to a place of enjoyment of your life, enjoyment of those passions, to the, and you'll be experiencing that in the best possible manner. But don't stay where you are just because you're afraid and don't stay where you are just because you're comfortable. In fact, I believe personally that the desire for comfort is going to kill many people right? because we are addicted to it. Uh, we are in this, in this world that we live in. We're so used to having everything on our plate, everything given to us or, or we just earn a little bit of money and we can get anything we want. You know, and I see in Western cultures in particular, and in some cultures even more than ours, um, you can go to supermarkets in some place of the world and the supermarket is like five acres. And, and the, there's a whole row of cereals that goes for 100 metres. Like 100 metres of different types of cereals. Like that's choice which is great, having choice is great, but we're so used to having this choice now available to us without any effort of our own personal effort aside from walking in the door of a supermarket. And as a result of that, we are taking less and less personal responsibility for our lives and becoming more and more detuned from what it actually requires for us to live. We're becoming more detuned from the cleanliness of our air, of our water, and of our food because we're so detuned from the process of its creation and that's not taking personal responsibility so so my belief is that if you allow yourself to stop worrying about when and concern yourself more with desire passion for your life and and fully engaging those desires and passions then there's a very good chance that if you do that and address the issues of comfort and control that you have over your life, that eventually you'll find yourself living. If you want to live in the f in the future world, you'll you'll live in a place that's quite safe. Uh, but you'll also that won't be a primary importance to you. The primary importance will be you'll be doing what you want to do for a change instead of doing what you feel like you have to do. I guess the only thing I think of is that. I want to be in an area that inspires me creatively. So sure. when you look at it, okay, I want to be near the theatre, I want to be near the supermarket, near the beach, that's all good. Yeah. But what about this extra level where it's something that inspires my passion? Exactly. Is that an attachment? Or well, no, I feel that's more important than the other things, the comfort things. Okay. You know, I feel when anything that connects you to your soul completely is far more important than any external thing. The reality is that we can connect to our desires and passions and discover, as you call it, our soul's purpose, whereas what I, what I would call it is a lot of our natural personality that God has designed within us. So every one of you has a different personality that God has designed and every one of those personalities have different primary passions. And I feel quite strongly that every single person, if, if every single person engages those primary passions, and also engages the process of growth towards God, growth towards their soulmate, growth towards truth, growth towards love, if they engage all of those things at the same time, they will eventually be led to a certain location. And that location won't be necessarily be, you know, in Mergen to King Arroy, Australia. Right? There are many, many places on the planet that are going to be safe and in the end, uh, that are going to enable a passionate existence. And we'll be led to those locations, wherever they are in the world. Right? There's six, what I feel will be, you know, five or six continents in the world that are going to have relative safety. Um, You've just got to know where to live on them. And, and it's not an issue of safety. It's more of it, because it, this whole issue of safety is flawed from the beginning. Because safety assumes you can die. And the reality is you can't. So, <laughs> why are we making choices that are based around safety? Because you can, you, your physical body can pass, but you'll just be left in the spirit world following the same passions and desires that you had when you were on earth. Now, now those of us who are attached to the earth and what it gives us, obviously are going to have more difficulty with that process 
than a person who's not attached to the earth and what it gives us, but rather we're attached to our desires, passions and living a life in harmony with love and truth, we're going to find that a lot easier to live, whether we pass or we stay, than a person is who's attached to physical locations. So if you're attached to a physical location, I suggest there's a lot of addiction in it. And the key is to work through the addiction. Yeah. Because in the end, you can be in any location on the planet and still be in your passion and desire and still be enjoying where you're living if you work through the emotions that are involved with the comfort and all of those other kinds of things. Look, myself and Mary have discussed this many times together like in terms of the addictions that we see and sometimes you know, we see things like even the addiction to feel like, like you're a part of something causes you to be in a certain location that's busy the addiction to wanting popular approval. In other words, all of our mates, all of their friends, all think that this is cool, so we do it because everybody believes it's cool. And that is another addiction that we have. So a lot of times we're living in a location that's got nothing to do so much with the location. It's got more to do with the actual things that are going on between the people in the location. The the actual condition of their soul has attracted us to that location. So in the past I've talked about different locations and the feelings that I get from different locations and the feelings are often very different to what you have about the same locations and I'm, I'm feeling like wow why would I ever go to that like there's some locations that I feel are extremely arrogant and self-centered locations you know because all the people there are extremely arrogant and self-centered the location becomes extremely arrogant and self-centered. It becomes up itself, as the Australian term is, right? And you go to that location, you can feel this underlying arrogance in the location. And then you wonder, well, what would attract a person to this location? And if you, under, if you think about it, lots of different emotions would attract you to that location. A desire to be a part of people who are arrogant about themselves. A desire to feel better about yourself. A desire to feel like you're more cosmopolitan and hip and cool and so forth. There's a lot of reasons that move us to a place. And I feel that one of the reasons why people are asking a lot of questions about earth changes is because they're unwilling to address the addictions of all the locations they're currently living in. Yeah, that's great. Mm. Yeah, so yeah. just keep doing what I'm doing, basically. Exactly, yeah. exactly. You've you've moved a number, you know, a number of times in the last year or so, haven't you? Now, and like the reality is that you might move a few more times in the next six months. You don't know because you don't know where your life's going to lead you unless you passionately embrace it. If we're unwilling to change, that's when we get stuck. We once we get stuck, we can basically. Basically, that's the extent of our development now on Earth once we're stuck. We don't want to be stuck. You want to keep embracing your passion and desire, change, have everything change. Many of you, in the end, will be living overseas. You won't be living in Australia. Like, so I see everything as a temporary, temporary circumstance, you know? There are certain things that we can accomplish together temporarily at this point in time. But uh, as time progresses and more and more people get to know the divine truth and more and more people practice love, there's going to be many, many beautiful opportunities for you to express your desires and passions in other locations of the planet than being in Australia. But see, if you see, if you don't embrace these desires, you'll never discover that. Right? Babe, you'd like to make a few comments? You want to come up and make a few comments, don't you? That's the point, isn't it, though? We can't skip to the end. We can't skip to where mm. we're going to end up. We have to live passionately where we are right now in our desire and work through whatever's there for us so that in the end we might end up overseas. But maybe we've got to live on the coast and then we've got to live, I don't know, in Gympie and then we've got to live in Alice Springs and then we'll be in... Bulgaria, but <laughs> that might be yeah. our life path, but we can't go to Bulgaria straight away because we've got to live passionately where we are right now. And if we just committed to that, that's when God can connect to us the most when we live in our souls. So, yeah. 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 It's important. Mm. 
You're joining me permanently? No. no. I just wanted to say one more thing sure. about when you were speaking earlier about the emotional processing. Yep. And not discussing that as much with people. Um, obviously, I was just talking to some people before we started about how I'm really in the midst of, if you like, my emotional processing. But I don't feel that it's emotional processing. I feel it's the beginning of a relationship with my creator. <laughs> and and that's why I feel so excited about this next series of talks that we're going to give, which is about relationship with God mm. and the qualities of God, the qualities of real love. Because um, these are the things that, unless I have them in my sights, emotional processing becomes circular. It's not anything. It's, it's pointless. It's just emotion. Mm. But when I'm really going for God, <laughs> then my emotions come out of me as a part of that that goal, that passion, mm. and I feel that is a place where a lot of people are lost <laughs> at the moment. There's a heavy emphasis on emotion without remembering God mm. <laughs> and really why we're engaging this process. Mm. Everyone's trying to get to the end of it instead of going, wow, where am I with God? Where is my heart for God today? And what is God showing me in that relationship that needs to be healed? Mm. So, um, yeah, so I feel that we're not... It's not even – we needed to talk about emotions because that's uh, – a lot of us walk around really detuned from our emotional selves. Mm -hmm. But it, it really is, like you said, just the really bottom layer of, of just an awareness, if you like, that then becomes – I feel so much more empowered in that process of – I don't even like the words emotional processing – the process of growing in love and growing towards God – when I know, you know, when I'm praying constantly, when I'm constantly focused on this God connection, that's when it all kicks into gear. And I know many of you are feeling uh, tired in your emotional process and f trying to measure where you're getting to mm. in terms of emotion and injury. And uh, my advice is forget it. <laughs> Focus on your relationship with God and how clear is that connection and how much are you feeling that? And if you're not, what's God showing you in that process? And then humble your heart to that mm. whatever's there. And I'd probably add to what Mary said in terms of focus also on your relationship to truth and love. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, it, you know, obviously they are going to help you get closer to God. For many of us, because of what we'll discuss today in a minute, yeah. we're quite blocked still towards God. But, but we're less blocked because of us allowing ourselves to deal with our emotions at the moment, we're less blocked to issues of love and truth. So allow that growth in love and truth to continue and notice where you're not being loving. Like often, often we observe things going on that are done in the name of the divine love path that are so unloving that we just sort of got to... Sometimes I say to Mary, I don't know whether I'm actually teaching any good because... <laughs> <laughs> what I just observed there from somebody that's been associated with it for two years and their, their unloving behaviour was worse than some of the unloving... Well, far worse than, than the <laughs> behaviour of many of the people that I was in a religion with. And I, I'm saying, going, wow, like, how can that be? After two years of truth... Something's going wrong. What's wrong with me? <laughs> Is sometimes what I felt. Not so much now. But, but there's, a, there's this feeling sometimes that we have that it's all about emotions and it's all quite selfish. But the reality is love is never selfish. And love and truth are the primary things that are going to bring us to God. So Yeah. Mm. And if you're becoming more self-absorbed in your emotional process, I put to you, you're not... You're not growing you're not you, your compass if you like it to me it's like a compass towards love mm -hmm. <laughs> because as you know you're going to talk to about today um which i feel is so important i was really blocked to the concept of god in the beginning as well um because of a lot of the injury i just inherited through reincarnating um but this compass for love has always been a really strong um compass in my life and if you if your compass isn't set to love if it's set to i've got to get through this emotion or a, or com competition many of you i have observed mm. um i'll just say honestly i've observed a lot of competition amongst people towards how much did you cry did you are you through that yet uh, people say to me what you're not through that yet um <laughs> there's not that's there's, there's no love in that guys <laughs> so the compass isn't set to love 
you know. If, and as you, as you enter this emotional sensitivity, if you like, this understanding emotionally of who you are, if you're really engaged in that process and your compass is set to love, you're going to feel that most strongly. Oh, I wasn't very loving there. Instead of... Oh, they weren't very loving there. Wow, I can feel that even my response to them is not very loving there. In, and fa that in fact, we often observe that your response to unloving behaviour of others is worse than the unloving behaviour perpetrated by them towards and, you. And, and there's this real, I was just telling the truth, <laughs> thing that really disguises a lot of nastiness mm -hmm. uh, between other people. Mm. And um, it is a really big concern for both of us mm. because... We do feel like we want to share with you this passion for love and God and truth. Uh, and often, like I have compassion for that as well because I know when we come in in our injured state, it's easy just to intellectually hear the words and then use our emotions <laughs> and our injury in the same way we just change the language. Mm. But I just feel it's really important to point it out that, that we observe that happening <laughs> at times and that... If we set our compasses to love and God and truth, that's when so much change and growth can happen really rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, when people um, perhaps get together in groups, the injuries can become... Uh, we can live in our injuries unless we're really solid on our compass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But I think that's... Oh, somebody... Is that... Ina, is it up there? Ina? Right up the back. Thanks. Um, I've got a question about telling truth because um, I'm a bit confused. I used to be one of these people who am... Um, who are giving truth and um, in trying to... Um, by me trying to express how I feel, I've blamed a lot of other people. Yeah. And yeah. I'm trying to um, unlearn that process and I find it really difficult. And yesterday I had a situation with um, Gary and I got really triggered by something and um, I, I didn't know how to, how, how to bring it back to me. I felt really annoyed about something like... Yeah. I just give an example. It was like I felt like Gary wasn't telling as much truth to me um, as I wanted him to about how he feels. So sometimes I um, observe something or I feel an emotion in him, upsetness or whatever, and um, unless I ask him about it, like he didn't share it. So I feel triggered by that. Can and I just stop you for a moment? Yeah. It? When I'm in that situation, the first question I ask myself is, what do I not want to know? Like if, if I've got somebody not telling me the truth and I know they're not telling me the truth or I feel that they're not, the first thing I reflect upon is my own condition that's attracted it, not, not theirs. And this is where I feel many of us go astray. We're, we're not firstly reflecting upon our own condition. So when I'm not getting told the truth from, say, Mary, the first thing I've got to ask myself is why don't I want to know the truth? Okay. There's something going on here. What's the? Why is there a feeling of anger or annoyance inside of me that the person is not telling the truth? And do I still like share to my partner that I'm just annoyed and um, so, or well, do certainly, just leave yeah. it with me because like what I got from yesterday that's really important to just share all the time with how how I feel. I agree, but we do need to go deeper than that. Remember, I said that yesterday yeah. too. And and the thing we need to do is we go, okay, I am annoyed, but I realise that it's not your responsibility to tell me the truth. So obviously my annoyance is to do with something else inside of me as to why I'm annoyed. And that's where I can get confused too because I get to the point where I say, look, I'm annoyed and I don't even know what it's loving to tell you why because as soon as I'm going to tell you I'm annoyed because you don't tell me truth, Kim, it's already a blame. Yeah, but... Blame starts emotionally, not, not with not your words. Not intellectually or... So yeah. I, can, I can be with AJ and go, I'm annoyed. <laughs> and I go, no worries, babe, what are you annoyed about? <laughs> um, and and I then can, Mary tells me what she's annoyed about. Yeah. And I can say, well, it's because you wore your red shirt. <laughs> and, and, I say, and I'd say, well, what about red bothers you, darling? <laughs> and I can keep going, <laughs> but I'm really blaming him for something, aren't I, yeah, for my own yeah. annoyance. But I can go, babe, I'm just feeling really annoyed. <laughs> 
and there's so, I'm owning that. This is my feeling. It's not you creating this feeling. And if I want to know Mary, there's a high, a high likelihood I'll ask her why. And I'll so. go, it's about the red shirt. I don't know. <laughs> Something about the red shirt upsets me, right? It's my issue, you know. Yeah. There's, there's all, it's my issue. If and, I go, and I'm and annoyed, know, it's like it's your and issue. And you know in the discussion, mm-hmm. we, it could get down to the fact that I'm wearing a red shirt of an ex-girlfriend that she gave me or something like that and that's what really annoys her. You know, yeah. if, if, we, if we fully engage the discussion down into the depths of it without projecting the rage at each other, then we can get right down to the bottom underlying emotion yeah, that caused that. Yeah. If we're truthful, we can go all the way down. However, if your partner doesn't want to engage that yeah. process, that is their choice. Yeah. And we can't get annoyed with them for not engaging that process because as soon as we're getting annoyed, we're now being more unloving than they are. They're just mm-hmm. wanting to withdraw. You're wanting to now project rage at them. So now you're being more unloving yeah. than the person that you're saying who's unloving to you. So I just feel a lot of times there's not enough self-reflection in terms of your own feelings. And also when you ask the question about truth, Let's be more specific about what truth is. Truth isn't the annoyed emotion you feel. That's what I, yeah. That's not the truth. That is your error being imposed upon what's happening. So, for example, let's say an event occurs. So, just, so an event occurs, it triggers within you a feeling of anger where you're annoyed, uh, annoyed or whatever, frustrated or whatever. Now, Stating that is not, anger is already not the truth because underneath the anger is the addiction that you want met that's not being met and that's more truth and underneath that addiction is the fear that you have that you've used this addiction to cover over, that's more truth and then let's get down to it, the grief that you feel that's underneath the fear is the actual truth of what has just occurred Now, when you're in the anger of it, you can say, I'm angry with you because, but you're not yet, and it's very important that we personally understand that we're not yet in the truth. Yeah, I understand that. So, So. yeah. So do Uh, I still tell my partner, if that's where I'm at, and I don't know what the addiction is yet, so I'm still going to say... And if your partner is in a loving space, he'll go, yeah, be angry. (laughs) Because this is going to help you find what the addiction is. What do you want from me? What is it about this red shirt that really bothers you, darling? Yeah, I think that's where we get stuck. Because if I'm, let's say, angry and say, yeah, look, I'm angry about this and this and this, and then Gary gets generally angry about me being angry, then we're both Well, he feels the injustice of your anger, which is Mm. his own emotional error. Like... Do, do you understand? Yeah, yeah. So, So he needs to then go down, all right, the event of your anger triggers his anger... And that's not the truth of his emotion either. Yeah, and and underneath his mm-hmm. emotion is his addiction and so forth and so forth. And then we're both not really in a state to actually even talk anymore. Of course, so, yeah. because you're both not in truth. Yeah. You're both not being humble at that point. You're just both wanting your addictions met and none of you are getting your addictions met. So it isn't, you're not speaking the truth by saying, I'm angry with you and he's saying, I'm angry with you. I'm angry with you because you're angry with me because... And we're just angry with each other, but we're not mm-hmm. getting any deeper because we're not wanting to face what the addiction is. So, so we are not yeah. being truthful. Right. That's the reality. We're better off shutting our gob and... Just go away and feel we, that. Feel we why we're so... Feel our rage in that moment. Because mo- to be honest... No, I don't even feel that. You don't want to know what the addiction is. So you can go and feel the anger, but you're still going to be blaming Gary while you're feeling the anger. Exactly. So I, I wouldn't even go and process then. The only time I would process my anger is when I go, this is my anger. It's not because of the red shirt. That's what's triggered it. It's yeah. my anger. If I can't, Im- and when I get angry now, I go, "There's something I want." <laughs> can there's, can there's I just an addiction point out something, babe? Mm. It's the resistance to dealing with your addiction. So there's a resistance, resistance yes. to dealing with the addiction that caused your anger in the first place. Yeah. If you can't, you need to feel this resistance, not okay. the anger. You need to feel what this resistance is about. Is it that you're going to be that you're just humiliated, or you're just pulled yeah. down, or these are all resistances 
to getting your addiction met. See, any time somebody doesn't meet your addiction, you're going to go into resistance. Mm. You're going to be annoyed with them for not meeting your addiction. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Now, we've given long talks about addictions yeah. again. So, so if you notice yourself in that process with a partner, go back to those talks and listen to the talks about addictions, like what actually happens with addictions. Every time you resist feeling your addiction, you will go into anger. Okay. So as soon as you're angry, so, so your addiction is you want him to listen to you or something like that. He didn't yeah. listen to you. So you, you get angry with him and you tell him, I didn't listen to you. Now you're in resistance of your own addiction. You don't want to feel how much you want the man to just say nice, pretty things to you. Yeah. Right? And then he gets a barrage from you of anger. What, his, his addiction is, I want to make a woman pleased. I'm not pleasing her now, and this feels now unjust because I didn't know what I did to make her displeased. Yeah. So now he then kicks into his addiction of wanting to please the woman. He's not meeting that because you're feeling not pleased. And so now he's in his anger saying how unfair this is and unjust this is that you're angry with him and so forth. And now both of you are avoiding your addiction mm -hmm. and both of you uh, have begun that process because you're resistant to your addiction. You don't want to feel that you have it, that it and it, that, that it's actually damaging. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It, it makes sense. Can we just say how it can work a different way? Because sure. we yeah. do work this process a very different way. Or yeah. We often talk about how it doesn't work and why it doesn't work. Yeah, so that's not going to work. That yeah. doesn't work. <laughs> I got that. But we get from here to here pretty well now Yeah. Um, without a lot of other reaction you know mm. and that's because whenever there's anger I go okay this is my anger <laughs> there's something I want yeah what do I want I want you to make me feel something it's always an emotion that I okay. want or, yeah. or I want you to help me avoid this emotion that's just say it's the red shirt okay I'm angry about the red shirt I, I can't okay babe I can't figure it out I'm just it's I'm really angry about it Maybe I go away then and go, okay, I want something uh, and I don't want to know what it is. And maybe. Well, I this red shirt triggers Mary in some way, some memory that, you know, mm. that bothers her. Yeah. It, and it can be a very harsh memory. Like, it could be for some of you that a guy with a red shirt abused you sexually. Like, it can be like that. Like, sometimes you don't know where the link's going to take you. So you need to just go with the link. Yeah. So once I identify, well, okay. I'm addicted to you. <laughs> well, say it's the ex-girlfriend. What is it about this shirt? Someone else gave that to you, okay? I don't. And immediately I go, well, what don't I want to feel here? What's my addiction? I don't want to feel that there's other women who've been in his life. I don't. I don't know. I don't like that. And then if I'm really humble and I'm owning that, I go, actually, I'm just really afraid he's going to leave me. Mm. I don't feel like I'm important. Yeah. And in fact. You know, now I really feel emotional about the fact that I don't feel like, you know, dad wasn't, whatever it is about dad, dad wasn't there for me or, you know, for us it's like I felt like I've been For us the it's soulmate issues from our first century life generally. but Yeah. Mm. But you can get from there to there really quickly but you have to own it. Okay. And this is really about the law of attraction, isn't it? It's about saying God's created a law that created this red shirt for me mm. today. Oh, and I'm, I'm aware of that. Anger is my anger, but like I just do kind no, of no, no, no. As soon as you go, I'm angry at you about the red shirt. You are not, not aware. aware that the anger is your anger. Okay. You're saying it's mm. yours. You've created it. Yeah. So we, we're aware. It's that same thing. We're as soon as you're yeah. angry, you are no longer aware. You're already okay. saying, like now, it feels like I just hit the resistance. I just go, oh, okay, there's something here for me. Oh, it feels really big. This is where I used to get really angry. <laughs> okay, what is it? What do I want, you know? Mm. And it's it's having that ability to be with yourself emotionally enough to not react and get out of it. And anger is telling you that you're already in a process of resistance. That's yeah. why anger can be your guide because you, you, your guide, and there was a talk I gave nearly three years ago about this, yeah. anger being your guide to deeper emotions because every time you're angry, you know, wow, I'm in resistance straight away to love. I'm not being loving right now. I'm angry. And therefore, I'm in resistance to whatever it is that's creating my anger. I need to discover it rather than going and blaming the other person. Our, our instant response generally is to blame the other person. So like for two days last week, I was in a rage. It's very rare for me to be in a rage. Mm. It was about something that Mary did in the first century. Um, 
that obviously I've taken... No, no, I won't won't go there, but (laughs) I've dealt with it in the spirit world, obviously, and the event itself at the first century didn't bother me, but it now bothers me because of some of the injuries that I have. And, And so I just went into this rage. I wasn't in a rage with Mary, right, in the sense I wasn't yelling and screaming at Mary. I told Mary that I was in a rage and it was about this particular event. And I just need to feel my way through what, what the rage was all about. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. But I didn't go yelling and screaming at Mary, expecting her to change, expecting her even to acknowledge that what she did then wasn't loving. Yeah. I yeah. didn't even expect that. Like, because you can't expect that. Like, that has to be their own process. That's Mary's own process, you see, mm-hmm. not mine. I have to deal with the fact that I'm in a rage about an event that obviously I felt was quite hurtful. And I need to allow myself to settle into that hurt of it, uh, you know, which is still an ongoing thing for that event for me right now. So, so we have to settle into it um, through that process. As soon as I'm in this angry place that many of us still get into quite frequently, we're no longer aware of anything, mm. honestly. We're, we're just way away from God. We're way away from truth. We're way away from the truth of our addiction. We're way away from uh, being actually aware at the soul level of what the cause is of this rage that exists within us. Yeah. But that's why I feel like this. it's so good that we're talking more about God and love yeah. because the, if that is your compass, then you're like, I'm not focused on... I, I actually, God, I've been praying for days now about giving up, getting my addictions met by people. So... That's probably why I've attracted the red shirt, you know. And I immediately go, wow, this is about me and God. Mm. How, how uh, this is preventing me connecting with God. It's, it's a yucky feeling inside of my soul that I don't want to have because I want to love everyone, you know. And if, th- if I am really entrenched in that process in my life, then the red shirt, I don't even, you know, the anger, I don't think, okay, what's under anger? I just go, God, please take me to something that's going to heal this this issue with me and I step down through these things. Mm. Yeah. So usually, you know, usually the addiction always covers the fear but if you're unwilling to feel the addiction, you see a lot of our addictions feel very sleazy, they feel very shameful, they feel humiliating to feel and these are our blockages, these are our resistances to feeling the addictions because we don't want to feel shameful, humiliation, and you know a lot of those other types of emotions. So what we do is we set up the resistance layer, and the resistance layer for many of us is still quite impenetrable. You know, we don't even want to get through the resistance layer to to get underneath and feel the addiction itself for what it really is. It's a it's a error within us stopping us from getting closer to God, closer to our soulmate, closer to ourselves, and stopping us from living in our passions and desires. And it stops us from processing our fear, of course. That is the whole point of the addiction. And we're not even allowing any of that. And while we're trying to avoid our fear and our shame and our... Like, for me, I had a lot of judgment over over the top of what was really there in my addictions. I didn't... Mm. I'd glimpse them and then I'd go, whoa, I can't be that person. I'm going to avoid that forever. Mm. And um, I was just saying earlier to some people about how I really... My prayer has became and is constantly now, God, show me, show me my soul, show me the depravity of my soul. Like there's dark stuff in my soul that I've been avoiding like this all my life and trying to, trying to avoid through these top two layers. But when you really want to see it and God shows you and you want to see it, you don't get angry about it, that's when it can begin. Mm. That's when you drink the water. That's when it all, you know, that's when, the alchemy and the process can really begin because while you live in denial of it, God is trying to show you all the time, can you please see this so that you can heal it so that we can get closer? Um, Mm. While we're going, no, I'll see that little bit but then I want a bit of reward because I got through that. (laughs) I did that emotion. Um, We we lost sight because Mm. the hunger for God has got to be a hunger. You know, we've got to say, no, this is, I want God. I don't want to just feel good. (laughs) I want God. And, and that's where the faith and the courage and, and so anyway, we see I'm, that I'm actually, hijacking now babe. We're gonna go. <laughs> we see that this is a primary problem for most people they're still not allowing themselves to see their resistance Jeez. emotions to their addictions mm-hmm. you see we have so much judgment of ourselves because we grew up with so much judgment of ourselves 
we grew up with all this judgment and all these negative emotions towards ourselves being condemning all different things within us right so so what we finished up doing is we set, set up this layer of judgment that anything bad within ourselves we want to ignore we want to make it go away through some magical means this is why the world is addicted to magical means we're we're addicted to new age philosophy because we want a magical means of dealing with our negative emotions but there's no magical means aside aside from the the stuff that we've been teaching right that's the re reality but unfortunately because we're addicted to the magical means we're we're not willing to actually see and feel the addiction that we're so ashamed of ourselves that we even have and when you think about it, why am I even ashamed of having it when somebody else put it there? That doesn't seem very logical. You know, they should be ashamed that I have it, <laughs> not me. Exactly. And that's where knowing about God's love and God's compassion has been mm. so powerful for me. Mm. God's not judging me for this. God's loving me through this. Well, maybe I'm actually judging and punishing myself because someone, when I was really young, taught me if I judged and punished myself, they wouldn't judge and punish me as much yeah. you know yeah so it's these resistance emotions that are often dictating still many of our li many of us uh, uh, our lives that our resistance to feeling the feelings of judgment that we have towards our addictions towards our true picture in the mirror we don't want to see the true picture in the mirror and instead we want to resist that true picture by hoping that we're different than we really are but at the same time being the person that we don't like <laughs> this is what happens for many of us right and and the sad part i feel is that if you can feel the resistance you have to seeing the addiction and work your way through that emotionally so that you feel through the judgment that you've had in the past and the terrible projections that have come from your parents and so forth you will eventually come face to face with your true self which is your addictive self let's face it that is the self that when i say true self not the, the true moment. self god created that's the self this here is the self that your parents created remember we talked about the three selves and this is the self that your parents created full of addiction that's the self you don't want to see or feel or notice and all the pain associated with those addictions you don't want to see, feel or notice. And so what we do is we spend half of our life, well, the majority of people on earth spend all of their life avoiding that, avoiding their true self, avoiding the fact that they have all these very unpleasant addictions and emotions coming out of them. And what they do instead is they stay in complete denial through their resistance layer of any problem that they have within themselves at all. And you're never going to get to your fear or your grief doing that. And, and this is the bit where it, um, I was saying to a friend recently, she said, I'd just spoken a fair bit of truth to her about some addictions that were playing out in our relationship and with other... Oh, she's probably here somewhere. <laughs> can't see her. Um, and she said, I just feel like I'm getting nowhere. I can't believe this after all this time. I've been doing this for two years. I can't. And I said, do you know what? That's... Sometimes it's the moments when we feel like I'm not getting anywhere that we actually start getting somewhere because we've been willing to see this part of ourselves that we've been denying. Mm. So it, often for me it feels like I go along, I go, okay, okay, yep, face that, yep, going there. Whoa, now I feel like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I've got this in me. But what I've learned is that that's the time when I do the most growing because I've been willing to see the addictions and it opens me up to this whole other process. If you could imagine yourself as spirit in the spirit world, just arrived, and for the first time you get the opportunity to look in the mirror and see what you really are. Now, for the majority of spirits, when they do that for the very first time, they are absolutely shocked. And in fact, there are whole groups of spirits I've spoken to that in 2,000 years in the spirit world, they've never looked in a mirror. Something they used to do every day <laughs> on earth, they've never done since they arrived because they know in their heart that it ain't going to look good mm. and this is partly part of our problem is we have in our heart this feeling well if i really look in the mirror it ain't going to look good and so what we then do is we try to deny the process of seeing ourselves it's seeing the addictions and the and uh, the addictions are what causes all of our unpleasant stuff it causes all of our rage all of our 
all of our unpleasant stuff, our resistance, you know, the stuff that we dump on other people is caused by our resistance to our own addictions not being met. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we want our addictions met and that's why we dump on other people constantly. Now, it's the dumping of other, on other people that causes the actual damage to our soul. The actual damage in our soul all comes from how much we've dumped on other people unpleasant emotions. And as a result of that, my first thing that I really need to come to terms with inside of myself is going to be the level of my desire to dump my unpleasant emotions on other people. I'm half going to have to recognise at some point the truth of that. And recognising the truth of that is the secret to your own emotional openness, to your own deeper emotions of fear and grief. Without going through that layer and recognising that, you will never get below it. So many of us are above it, many of us are still in this place of resisting what's there. And we need to get below that place and feeling the fears that generated those particular addictions that we have. And, and that's where, under here, we need to write joy, babe. <laughs> because joy just pokes through those two <laughs> states all yeah. the time, you know. You won't feel joy above there. You will only feel joy below there. And it's awesome. And that's where God and joy reside when we're underneath our addictions. We can't expect to really engage with God while we live in addictions because we're trying to fill the hole that's supposed to be filled by God with other people. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Thank you so much. It was very helpful. Yep. Um, are these more questions about emotions? <laughs> <laughs> If, yes, keep your hand up. We'll go. Uh, where is the other mic? Oh, if you can take that other mic over. Yeah, that, that's good. Yeah. That's, it. that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's actually about addiction and the resistance of the addiction. Yep. Um, at the moment, I'm very confused about the use of marijuana. Yep. Because I understand that it can be a resistance to this addiction and understand also about the spiritual influence that I can have when, when I smoke. Yep. But by the, on the other hand, I feel that I don't feel that it's not totally a bad thing mm -hmm. because I see like it's a plant that God created mm -hmm. and God put there for us. I don't know. To, for, for what, but it's there. <laughs> Lots of things, I think. Probably not so much smoking. I'm wearing one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, and I also, like, I understand about the spirit influence as well, and I do feel the spirits. I feel sometimes the darker spirits, mm -hmm. but also something, like, opens up on me, and then I also get a good... I feel that I can get a good guidance. Mm -hmm from when, when I'm stoned. Mm -hmm. And also I feel that it opens, like, I feel that opens to my soul. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's like, maybe it's not true, mm -hmm. but that's how I feel because it, it goes like very deep inside of myself. What I put to you though, is that if you need a substance external to yourself to open up your soul, then you're obviously in an addiction when you're not getting that particular substance. Yeah. So that's telling me that if you need the substance, there is still an emotional injury in the soul that prevents you or, des or causes you to desire the substance. In the end, you won't need any substance external to yourself to be open to your own soul. And then with any type of addiction, there is always going to be spirit influence because we're, we're, we're headed towards the addiction because of the avoidance of a fear. And the avoidance of a fear always causes a spirit attraction. Always. And none of those spirits who are attracted to the avoidance of a fear are in a very good condition. They're all going to be dark spirits in a dark condition. And this is why many people who finish up having marijuana finish up later on also having issues like schizophrenia and other kinds of illness, which are all really spirit-related illnesses. The reason why is because their fear has been denied the addiction is in play, we get the addiction met through the, you know, the drug taking of any kind and then what happens is we have the ju internal justification for it occurring which skips over the fact that there is a fear that is generating the original desire for us to do it 
And then on top of that, we have a spirit attraction occurring, which is also going to be negative and a negative influence in our life, uh, affecting the entire process as well. Now, I'm not saying don't take marijuana, because it's up to you what you do with your life. And if a person wants to take any drug at all, it's completely up to them what they do. What I am saying is we have to realise or come to realise the full dangers of every kind of drug taking and, and see the underlying addictive emotions that are in play with every kind of drug taking, which I would include even things like you know, drinking alcohol and other types of things. Any type of drug that has a negative effect on the body in particular or has an, a hallucinogenic effect on the body is being taken for a purpose that is skipping over an emotion that exists that is preventing us from being totally open to uh, our own soul before we began. Yeah, because I feel really stuck mm -hmm. when I'm not taking it. And then sometimes it came now I'm gonna, once a week, okay, let's yeah. do it once a week. And yeah. then when I have it once a week, I have this big awareness of everything happening and I feel really connected to my desires, to, to what's inside of me. I don't want to need that. I want to be in that state without it. Exactly. But I just think, is this real, what I'm feeling? Well, unfortunately, like, most of the time it's not. Unfortunately, what you're doing is also attracting a spirit who has an awareness but also enjoys the drug. And all you're getting is a very close connection with that particular spirit who now gives you his or her awareness because they are also addicted to the drug. And, and as a result of that you finish up not having your own emotional awareness, but rather the emotional awareness of another person being imposed upon you. It feels good because you feel clarity and you feel some kind of uh, relaxation of your own fears, but it's not going to be a state that exists permanently. It's only going to be a state that exists when you take the drug. Yeah, mm. I, but it, can the spirits also like help us to go into the, the memories from childhood? Because... I go into like deep inside of like everything that happens in my past. So it can't be other person's emotions. It feels so real for me that well, so it's no, my it, life. It helps it's you me. overcome an emotion of resistance to your past when you're not stoned. So, so what I'm suggesting to you is that being stoned causes a less resistance to your own examination of your own past. So what is it that you get out of being stoned? And I suggest to you it's a feeling of security and safety and a few other things that you're getting um, that it enables you to go back into your past that you are unwilling to go back into when you're not stoned. And that tells me there is a lot of fear generating the desire to be stoned because otherwise you would be going back into your past and your past memories without needing to be stoned. Does that make yeah. sense? Thank yeah. you very much. Not a problem. Yeah. Now, um, I don't want to continue with this discussion, actually. <laughs> My desire is to talk about the subject I've written on the board. And like I said to you earlier, um, we can talk about individual emotional conditions to, like, for the next year. And many of you are asking the questions because you're still not wanting to actually have a good, close and honest examination of the material that's already been presented to you about those matters. Does that make sense? That's the feeling I have. Um, I don't know. Like it's, it's important to understand our emotional blockages and emotional issues, but, but I do feel that um, all the material that we need to present has been presented on these subjects and there is really no need to rehash the material um, because I feel that if we rehash the material, we're not learning new things for a start. And secondly, we're not addressing one issue and that is we are obviously resistive to the material that's already been presented. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Like, if all this material is being presented and there are some people who are embracing the material completely and, and who are actually making progress that we can observe around us and yet we are not making that progress, then we need to look at our own emotional resistance to our own truth inside of ourselves. And We've said that over and over again, and it doesn't matter how much we discuss personal emotional issues with you, if there is a personal resistance within you to dealing with these emotions, we are better off just saying, what you just did was unloving, and this is the behaviour that would be loving, and I'll leave that with you. 
And you take more personal responsibility for clearing that unloving behavior out of your soul, for clearing that unloving desire out of your soul. And this is where you and God can do a lot of work rather than relying on people externally. Now, I'm not saying that, that you shouldn't have discussions with external people because there are times when it's lovely to be able to work through an issue with another person. But make sure that when you do, that it's somebody who actually knows more about your own emotion than you do. Many times what we're doing is we're going and discussing something with somebody who knows less about our own emotion than we do. And you're never going to get some very clear answers doing that. You're far better off talking to God and your spirit guide friends than you are talking to the majority of people on earth about your emotional condition. That's the reality. Because most, most people on earth are in the same condition that we are. So how can they really help us to identify and release the unloving behavior that we have? So the whole purpose of our God, the God's Way of Love uh, organization is to focus on the resistance that's present and to be honest and truthful with you about that resistance without taking responsibility for your own work. So what we're going to be doing more and more in that organization is asking people who are not being loving to just know you need to go away for a while, you're not being loving now, go away for a while and work out why you're not being loving. Rather than telling them why they're not being loving and then having a conversation, a long conversation as to why they're not being loving and so forth and at the end of the day they still don't want to feel why they are still embracing the unloving behaviour. Do you see the difference? This is what God does with you, right? God doesn't give you her love when you are totally blocked to receiving it and God doesn't inform you of anything in your life until you want to know the truth. That's what God does. God does not tell you anything about your life unless you want to know. You have to want to know. And this is why I said in the first century, keep on seeking then. Seeking. I said keep on knocking, keep on asking, keep on seeking. First, God's love. So the keep on seeking part, many of us are still not embracing. We're expecting it to all come to us on a platter. We're expecting a, you know, like a meal. We're expecting, we're expecting mummy, just like many of us do expect mummy, to prepare the meal, cook the meal, clean up after us. And we're still expecting God to do that, rather than being willing to examine our own personal life in a lot more um, positive manner, which is taking personal responsibility. And that Bible passage was really powerful for me in my couple of months on my own. I re it really, I never read the Bible and I was suddenly really drawn to different parts of the Bible and that one was especially um, because when you're not having your hand held all the time, it can feel like you get slower. <laughs> feel like, oh, I'd really like someone just to tell me what this is now rather than having to sit with the uncertainty and the fear and all of the yucky feelings that I'm not getting anywhere and all of that. And I was really guided to this feeling that if you keep knocking, if you keep seeking, if, you keep, if I keep my compass in the right direction, it's going to happen. And actually it's going to happen in a more real way if someone's not holding my hand because I will have broken through that resistance to what it was. Yeah. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. All right, well, I'm busting to go to the toilet. So, um, so perhaps if we can have a 10-minute break so those of us who are busting to go to the toilet can go to the toilet. And we can just come back. But we'll have a break in another hour's time for any meal stuff. So if we I, just And I won't be back break. after the break. But just really enjoy this talk. I think it's going to be awesome. <laughs>